Easter special. Hello and welcome to the Easter special of Slash Dupe, the mysterious movie pitching podcast with a twist. I'm Sean, your peerless moderator, and I'm joined by my Slash Dupe regulars and co-hosts, Dan and Ryan. How are you doing, Dan? How are you doing, Ryan? Good, good. good. Thank you. Good, good. Um, happy Easter. Happy Easter. We uh, traditionally, or whenever it is, whenever this episode goes out. This actually goes out, uh, yeah. As if Easter even matters during uh, a pandemic. It's, you know. <laughs> this will be on Good Friday, so probably, you know, a sad day. Yes. Mm. To be celebrated soon, the happy day. Yes. Mm. R.I.P. Big Man. <laughs> <laughs> so, Never forgotten. <laughs> Never forgotten. Not Pull when we see him on all those crosses. Um, Can't wait to get so, into this cracking episode. Yeah. Oh, excellent pun. That's oh, horrendous. Pow. I'm not even going to join in to the puns. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's because you ain't got one. Yeah, yeah that's not, true. It's because I haven't got not, one. Not hard-boiled enough, mate. <laughs> oh, that is good. You'll make him cross. I went there. I went there. Oh, that's good. <laughs> oh, you guys Sean scrambling even, for a, for Sean scrambling for a pun. aren't even bunny. Funny. Oh, get no. it? I see, see where you went right, with right. that. It was just, just it was all c- 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 combo yeah, breaker. <laughs> <laughs> so traditionally um, on Slash Deep, we hear three different ideas based on one title. Um, but today has um, an Easter theme attached to it in the form of Easter eggs. Um, I, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss and pitch the idea that uh, that got our creative juices, uh, the, the Easter eggs that got our creative juices flowing and maybe any ideas that fell out of that. Um, and it's funny, isn't it? Because when you think of Easter eggs now, you think of post credit sequences. Um, so we're going to particularly today, we're going to talk about Marvel because I just saw the second episode of um, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. We've just finished the run of WandaVision. With the amount of people indoors, with the amount of people subscribed to Disney+, Plus, I feel like this is where we're going to get the bulk of our sort of MCU content now. The bulk of our content. Absolutely going to hit content. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, And all the Easter eggs are going to be doled out. And um, you Sorry, know, Sean, like, my, my phone's just ringing. Oh, it's the zeitgeist. It's the Marvel zeitgeist. <laughs> and they, they want us. We're catalyzing. You guys want us now? Okay, cool. All right, we'll be there. Don't worry. So it's like, you know, one division. everyone was, was... This is the funny thing about Easter eggs, aren't they? they they're teased um, beforehand now, which is the opposite of what I, I've always associated an <laughs> Easter egg to be. Is these Easter eggs are teased beforehand, and then people will then, obviously, as, as it's supposed to do, create this sort of furor, and they go online and they talk and they generate buzz, and then um, whether it's what they wanted or what they didn't want, they also generate buzz afterwards. So it's a very, it's yeah. a very different thing now, Easter eggs. Um, than than when they were when even before the post credit sequences, but which we'll get to of course. I'm sure, I know Dan, you wanted to talk about one in particular um, in a, in a minute. Um, yeah. But even before the post credit sequences, there were just little little tidbits. So I remember, um, and we will we'll get into the the recent Marvel stuff. But I remember when they weren't some of the Marvel properties were owned by other studios. So my first sort of foray into it is I saw. Blade 2, it's the first one I saw, on a pirated VHS, and I just had no idea what it was, right? I'd never seen something that took horror and action, not at that age anyway, that took horror and action and put them together. I thought it honestly blew my mind. It was, it was my favourite movie ever. Here's, here's, a, weird, here's a weird uh, connection. Blade 2. Here's a weird connection to that and one of my first examples of an Easter egg that is not sitting in this. I remember you and I, Sean, we watched, uh, you had a special edition of Hellboy 2, mm-hmm. and obviously Guillermo del Toro directed both of those, mm-hmm. and in the, there was an introduction video of him talking, and his English was terrible, and once you watched that, it unlocked an Easter egg on the DVD for you to, for him laughing at the script that he was giving, because it was written really badly, and so that to me is what I associate Easter eggs with before they've sort of become this like nod in a wink that they have become now. They were actual things. Yeah. Or when you had to like put up, up, down, down, left, left, right, right on the DVD. Yeah. I think it was a star Wars DVD that did that. Wasn't it? Konami code. And like, well, it's interesting as well because we're talking about Easter eggs. Like we know what they are, but I asked, obviously as always, I asked my family for their help. (laughs) Um, with my uh, offering and I said oh look well I need to it's all based on easter mm. eggs and my wife obviously then reeled off um, her favourite eating easter eggs 
<laughs> and I know and, your wife, that's a very sweet thing. I can imagine that being yeah. quite an earnest. An uh, absolutely earnest. earnest. What were they, by yeah, the way? Because I'm actually genuinely oh, curious. It's definitely, she's a, she's a cabbage top. cream egg oh, kind of girl. Okay. No, she's a cabbage okay. cream egg kind of yep. girl. Sort of, yeah. Um, cabbage cream egg. Yeah. Uh, but obviously, I would, um, I would get her a, you know, a Thornton's or yeah. probably a bit more than that, you know, like, I don't know, maybe a green and blacks if I was running oh, it through okay. a. Yeah, yeah. Run it through a, a supermarket because I didn't have the time because I'd forgotten last minute. Uh, n- not not something that's happened. Um, but yeah, I had to explain yeah. the idea of an Easter egg because that's not necessarily in their wheelhouse. Yeah. Well, my four year old definitely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, not yeah. in his wheelhouse. And maybe they maybe they are sort of uh, even these days. Maybe they'd be called something different. I don't know. But yeah, I used to know them as DVD Easter eggs. That was the first mm. example. Mm. Yeah, so. Um, Memento had an Easter egg where he, he went all the way around the houses on the Memento DVD and then it eventually played the film in sort of chrono, quote unquote chronological order. So it was mm. like, yeah, these, these coming in on this sort of DVD train, you know, you had a, a X-Men 1.5. I remember that. That was yeah. the first, one of the first special editions I ever bought. And it was one of the first, again, one of the first DVDs I ever bought. And it was twenty four ninety nine, by the way, which is ridiculous. <laughs> I still yeah, remember that. From HMV. From HMV. Um, and yeah, it, it, there's something about um, these early superhero films that, that the Easter eggs were almost sort of, uh, uh, I don't know, they, they, they were quietly peppered in the same way that they would be peppered mm. into. Little treats, well that was the yeah. whole point of it, wasn't there? You, mm. got, you got things like the uh, Fight Club at Easter yeah. egg where there's a Starbucks cup in every scene. Yeah. And, yeah, or you um, have like the 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 frame, the porno frame spliced the frame. in. Of, yeah. yeah, that's. I mean, that's called out in the film, but the uh, the Starbucks is called called out after. Yeah, by, yeah. by Fincher, and um and like in the Godfather, where there's tomatoes, isn't there? Where before oranges. anyone dies, is always oranges. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Mm. And yeah. and so there's, in, there's oranges in, like in in every scene that that where yeah where somebody dies and in sort of yeah Scarface I believe there are like X's on the um uh or uh, it, the X motif in the original Scarface there's like the 1939 Scarface is there to to show that someone's about to die as well so it's like yeah right. these sort of things that are then talked about obviously that would have been way pre-internet message boards mm. and stuff and then it would have mm. been do you remember the imdb message boards that they got rid of eventually but that was where you would go for your sort of movie trivia well yeah. not even trivia because that's a different thing entirely but for your t- where people would go hey have you figured this out have you seen this and i remember in x-men one there's dr hank mccoy on the tv um and you bet he's yeah. you bet he's not in he's some generic actor with like you know some mm. awesome looking big chinned actor but you don't have him you know, in his beast. That, he's it's the not Kelsey Grammer? Things. No, exactly. <laughs> Who was great casting, by the way. In yeah. fact, that was the, maybe the best thing of X-Men 3. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I sort of came into these these things prior to the MCU, um, and I was quite an avid even, fan even of them. Even Pixar, Pixar with the numbers and the... I can't remember the, the act, what the actual Pixar is it, number is. Is it 133 or something like one, that? One, is it the classroom eight. they used to... Or something, yeah. yeah. One, one, and three. And then the... And the and Andy's ball, right, as well. That's the other one that I... That, I, that is in a lot of Easter eggs in, in, Di- in Disney. So they're really... Um, so actually, yeah, they were very early on in, in the game. Yeah. They were, they were um, putting Easter eggs in for their next movie. Because I guess because the cycle, development cycle for them is so long... They pretty much know what they're going to be but doing. I mean, next. But I mean, but I mean, yeah, even so before that, so every Disney like... film, every Pixar film will have the next films referenced in it, which is a very um, MCU. But thing no, but like Disney have been about doing it. it before that. You think about in Hercules when the rug is Scar um, from The Lion King, and you know, there's like, and then I think in I can't remember which one it is, someone is literally like beating beating a rug and it's um, carpet from Aladdin and things like that. So you know, like I, I would. Mm see a lot I think of that's these it. and that's probably why the mcu is the greatest known easter egg with especially with post credit stuff is because they they're one of the few franchises that is building across hundreds effectively hundreds of things now mm. isn't it rather than like even star wars is that you've got a limited number of films or the matrix limited number of films the in the mcu there are there are literally dozens and then Netflix series and stuff like that. So um, 
the idea of being able to have these post credit sequences mm. which give away something else that might be coming or tease it a little bit is um is manageable isn't it because they can like the Pixar stuff as well. They know what's coming. Yeah. Yeah, because at first they were they were putting the cart before the horse, weren't they? They were just mentioning yeah. stuff as if it might may or may not pay off. Might happen. And there are sort of examples of um, things being delayed and things being moved around. And, and yeah, so that, and then some of the promises are unfulfilled. But now, um, and DC particularly... And now people particularly know it's been, happening. ...has been doing that, yeah. yeah. Has been sort of not following but through on all, their, on all their Easter egg promises. People now, you know, we you don't leave at the credits anymore. Which I think also, as a person in the industry, I think that's fantastic because yeah. people used to get up and leave and, like, me and my wife all would always yeah. sit through the credits. We're one of those people. We yeah, always do. love to sit through the credits because I think it's a sign of respect, isn't it, yeah. to the people that yeah. put the time and effort into Decompression it. Decompression time as well. Yeah, yeah valuable absolutely. decompression time. And also like, you can yeah. talk spoilers there and then because everyone's already just seen the film. Yeah, so yeah, instead yeah, of risking fun. walking out and talking yeah. about them. Mm. Yeah. I never thought of it like that, mm. but I should be doing that from here on in when we can finally go back. Yeah. And now and, and uh, yeah, and yeah, so, now we're waiting to see them. So yeah. that's that's pretty cool. And it's it's um, like you said, like all these there's so many comic books by so many amazing um, authors and and artists over the over a long long time that have been building these bits of lore. And I'm sure today we'll delve into a few of the strange pockets and corners of them. But they've been building this lore and creating these stories in a completely different arena to the sort of MCU, um, with different licenses to do. You know, for example, Ragnarok is a fantastic example of how you remix the elements of Planet Hulk without giving you Planet Hulk. So it's like, they, you know, they yeah. have this wealth of stuff you can pick and choose from. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, Easter eggs have become a very different thing now. Um, but they are sort of full of promise, especially with, like, the un the different universes, the multiverses, the different Earths. Mm -hmm. And you have, um, you know, the new Spider-Man film apparently going to sort of bring other Spider-Men the actual act. Well, I'm I'm pumped for that because again, Spider-Man one, two. These were the these I saw well, these films. Uh, when they apparently, first came out. I know, but there's things like that. That's not being Tom. They've not told. They've told Tom Holland that that's not going to happen now. But that might be just be because he's a notorious spoiler, and it might just happen <laughs> as and when it as and when but it they does. They love it. I mean, like there's obviously there's an element of the Disney machine. Like we don't have to put any negative spin on it, but there's definitely that element of like. They're happy to have, you know, a few leaks here and there. They're happy to have Tom Holland's personality be the thing that reveals these things. They, so, I think they sort of enjoy it, you know. And I think, like, playing with, I mean, ever since, I don't know if you remember things like, I believe it was Transformers even, although I can't think now possibly why, um, and Star Trek Into Darkness and other things where they would flat out deny no, Khan is not in it. Khan is not in the next new Star yeah. Trek. No, we promise you on God. pain of death and the Khan. <laughs> and then he is. So it's like, there's a fascinating thing about, like, um, I don't know if I could, I know, the most recent example I can think of is in one division where Paul Bettany did an interview and he said, I've been wanting to work with this actor for a long time. He's one of my favourite actors. Um, it, this is going to be really special for me. And then, like... I'm going to just lay a quick spoiler out, but I, but I genuinely... It's the, dif the difference between a spoiler where I think you might be annoyed and a spoiler where you wouldn't really give a shit is this, is that the, mm -hmm. it's not really an important spoiler, is that he fights another copy of Vision. So he's essentially what he's talking about. This, this, this Easter egg that people were going, oh, it's going to be Mephisto. Everyone's like, Mephisto, Mephisto. It's, it's mm -hmm. going to be this, this grand demon villain architect of the Marvel world. And it was just Paul Bettany being, you know, a tool. Um, so it's like the ultimate like so the easter eggs can also become something quite sort of sadistic almost and, yeah. and an opportunity to sort of wind an audience up um which things like the deadpool movies have sort of taken the post credit sequence and done fun things with them yeah messed around with it yeah um so i first want to talk about my favorite post credit um mm. moment which was early on N it's not necessarily the best post credit sequence but it was the first time i realized how important these things were going to be mm. was it's iron man 2 i think where you see thor's hammer at the very end mm. of it yeah and um the, it pans out and you see thor's hammer and th this this was relatively new in the old mcu at this point right the the theater went absolutely apeshit like honestly, yeah, right. people like throwing popcorn and whooping and hollering, like, and like oh my god! <laughs> um, 
and now that would be like that's normal we'd expect that in the middle yeah. but i just remember how sort of intense that was um and so i've gone the complete and utter opposite route. <laughs> and actually mine's mine's more like i i think it's more of an I would want it to be an Easter egg within the film. So rather than a post credit sequence, the old, the old original Easter egg, and maybe even retroactively put in afterwards, which would annoy many, many, many people, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, but because the Inhumans uh, series got absolutely panned. Yeah, it did, didn't it? And um, I was watching, there's a Mr. Sunday annoying... movies where they, they go into it and it's like, it's glorious. When you, you know when someone else is suffering... So you don't have to. It's yeah, it's wonderful. <laughs> um, and it's a shame because the Inhumans are actually in a, co- a comic books. So they're a really interesting mm. set of um, characters. Um, but this comes from my family, and you, there's there's a running theme for the last few slash troops. Um, and I asked them at the table after explaining what Easter eggs were, what we should, who we should uh, talk about, and my little boy has Lego Marvel superheroes too. Mm-hmm. And he's been playing through that, and so we asked, we th- we said, let's choose a really obscure one. We don't want we don't want one of the things, and he suggested Lockjaw. Right. Okay. And I and so that's Ms. Mar- well, one of the Inhumans. It's the uh-huh. uh, the telekinetic, teleporting, uh, everything cosmically powered dog. Right. Um, who travels with Ms. Marvel a lot of the time. Nice. And um. It's. I like the idea of this, right? Because we're going close to mine and Maddie's winning, winning <laughs> episode of Cats and Dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, but I like the idea. So this is uh, combined with my love of the boys as well, mm. which is the idea that, you know, these superhumans, they just go and do their crap and everyone just has to put up with it. And you watch sort of um, the Avengers movies and they're destroying sort of towns mm. at a time. And... Uh, and then they just walk away. Yeah. Happy days. Yeah, yeah. See you later. Um, and you have the sort so of physical want... cleanup crew from Spider-Man Homecoming, for example. Um, that's that's you right. Know, the villains in there, they sort of find the tech and they, they're disgruntled at having to be these, these sort of um, blue-collar workers underneath the rubble of the, of the superheroes, yeah. you know, and they sort of do the physical cleanup. Yeah, and so initially we had a thought, we thought about that, but then we realised they were animals. <laughs> yeah. And so... Well, hey, well Lockjaw is an animal. I thought maybe the other thing they don't talk about is sort of the recovery of the recovery of the people of the yeah. town, right? And how they get over the fact that, you know, their cars... You see, it's great, great CGI. You watch a car go flying down after Hulk throws it, and you're like, I just spent 10 grand on that <laughs> yeah, car. Yeah, yeah. I just bought it today. Like, you cut to, cut to someone ringing their dad, go, I just bought my brand new car, first car today, dad. <laughs> Whoosh. There it goes. And so sort of the the emotional and psychic toil that takes on a, yeah. on a community and that maybe animals are the people to oh, help the community great. repair. Yeah. So we'd have Lockjaw leading his um, cosmically powered um, super heroic uh, animals um, to get through this. And, oh, and then I thought, hey, this is a perfect opportunity for Squirrel Girl to enter the fray. <laughs> And for those of you who don't know about Squirrel Girl, Squirrel Girl is a, um, she's an epic, epic superhero who can talk to squirrels. Right. She's not a squirrel That's... herself. Well, she's got a tail right. and some sort of um, so, bigger teeth so we're and sharp on nails. The market, which is good. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right? absolutely. Get some of that avatar money. But what <laughs> Squirrel, Girl's, Squirrel Girl has defeated in the MCU, mm-hmm. some of the most powerful villains. They've sort of got this running joke. She, like she beats Doctor Doom, uh-huh. and then after that, there's sort of this running joke, and you, a lot of the time, you don't see it happen. Mm-hmm. So, like, Squirrel Girl jumps into the fray, and then it goes off panel, and then it comes back, and she's won. Mm-hmm. Like, she beats, like, Deadpool, mm-hmm. MODOK, Wolverine. Like, she's beat... And, and at one point, I'm pretty sure she does... She sorts Thanos out as well at one point. Yeah. I can't remember if she does so. Well, Deadpool's and, um, one of the most powerful because she... he has the power to break the fourth wall, right? So if you can exactly, beat Deadpool... Exactly, but... And I believe that's because she also breaks the fourth right, wall. Right, okay. Um, but it's the power to talk to squirrels that we're talking about here. So oh, I think course. it would probably yeah. be... Look, yeah, we, I mean, we could go off on Squirrel Girl all day. But um, I think it's... what. The oh, my idea that I'd like you to help me flesh out mm-hmm. is the idea of this um, community 
um, counselling service for dealing with post post super heroic um, depression or yeah. something like that. I don't know what, what we there must there have to be a term, wouldn't they? Yeah, they would. Post be, super they? traumatic uh, trauma. Yeah, yeah. It's t- PST. Tension. Yeah. <laughs> post post, tension, post yeah. superhero tension. Yeah, no, well, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because animals, you know, if you stroke an animal, it's one of the things mm-hmm. that raises your, you know, your dopamine levels, it raises your T-cell count, it makes you healthier, it's one of these things. So literally an animal, in the, the right animal in the right hands can make somebody healthy, it can make somebody feel more positive. So I really genuinely like the idea of taking that to that next level. And yeah. also, I've been watching um, all the, I'm watching all the Disney films in, because of Disney Plus, obviously, um, mm-hmm. I'm watching them in order, for the, the major primary Disney classics. And, you know, there are a lot of animal themed, I'm up to Fox and the Hound, and there's a lot of sort of talking animals, obviously. And there's something yeah. in the, um, okay, it sounds a bit weird, but the sort of community of talking animals that they don't really do very well anymore. So they do a lot of sort of zany CGI animals in the city movies. They seem to mm-hmm. do well. But this sort of, you know, the, the, the one in 101 Dalmatians where they have that string of, the, I can't remember, it's called the Twilight Dogs. Bark or something. Yeah, but they have like their own way, network of, of communicating a p- past a certain time. Um, and, they, and I just watched The Rescuers and everything. So there's this sort of notion of like the community of, of animals doing things sort of under the eye of the humans, but completely without any of their support. Yeah. There's something... And effectively, yeah. that, that's the idea here is that like it's helping the the little person via sort of animals mm. and so that they don't realize that they're being helped or you know like it's just a dog that's helped that's come around at the right mm. time or whatever well, and i wonder whether there's sort of a a link to almost every film so that the the oh, episodes themselves yeah, are yeah. easter eggs in themselves so they ref, refer back to sort of like when happened. they time travel in Endgame, and you sort of you see the same event from a different angle but you're yeah you're seeing all these events but the animals have any animal in any of the mcu basically is your easter egg could be one saying. of those yeah. people that that's that's the whole point yeah and i really like that idea I really like the idea of that. That's great. And like, so you could have all the people that were on the train in the first Spider-Man that who he held mm-hmm. back with his, you know, the super webs, he, all of, you know, that community and how they they deal with it. Because I think, I think it'd be really nice to see how people view the superheroes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because we, we, you know, we don't often get to see that in the MCU. Yeah, you'd often you know I mean? you'd just get like a sound bite when someone's talking to a to a news reporter. Hey, that Spider Man needs to get out of our city, you know. And then someone yeah. else is like, you know, oh, he he works for the little guy. And it's like, but that's yeah. not that's not really like them in a room being what like, what must it be? Yeah, to live our like, train live came in off the world. tracks because Doctor yeah. Octopus came and he broke the switch off, and yeah. we would have all for the died. third time this year. <laughs> yeah. So like it's now now these people live in fear. Yeah. Like you get a normal commute, you could have you could have Thor jumping on it and electrocuting the whole thing while he's trying yeah. to protect you. But you know, how many times has Spider Man had to save people on trains or from falling off of bridges or yeah. you know the sort of collateral having down. a superhero Nacho. around. Yeah, having a superhero Nacho. around <laughs> kind of makes it more dangerous. Your your insurance, your house price would drop, wouldn't it? Yeah, surely. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, absolutely. So it's like, and it's all. It's not just even, you know, like that. That your car's been thrown across the city. It's like, well, everybody's going to be ruined. So that's you now. You also got to go to work. So then, when you're at work, yeah. you've got to take your break time, and you've got to spend your break on the phone, on uh, waiting. For someone to be free, to be able to even talk to them about your insurance. Yeah, you know, and insurance like, where do you live? Oh, no. Downtown That's Manhattan. a well-known place. Stark Central. Tower. Stark Tower up the road. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> yeah. no insurance for you. Yeah. Uh, and I, we don't, I think, just even talking to you, talking it out now, that would be a lovely, even through the eyes of the animals, mm. so that we're not, we're not having to, like, have a day-to-day John Johnson in his, in his house, mm. but we see these trying to these animals trying to make a better way a better world um but we can see the effect you know in a way that the boys kind of did but in obviously in a heavily exaggerated in a very dark gross fashion yeah yeah and i think it'd be nice to see sort of a level of i don't know reality in a superhero Mm. movie but what are the (laughs) repercussions because even the humans that we see in 
the Avenger or the MCU are like generally shield agents or people that are like buffed up mm. to deal with the superheroes. But or is everyone buffed up? Is that what happens? Or are these mm. do these um, cosmic um, animals are they around to make sure that they're sort of protected mm. from the the fallout from this kind of thing? Yeah. So. I, I, it reminds me a lot, actually, of... I, I, do you, I remember, Ryan, do you remember the game Akami? So, like, yeah. it reminds me of... There's one time when... So, you uh, you essentially play uh, a sort of mythical Amateur Japanese... Resu. Yeah, the, the mythical sort of sun goddess and the uh, sort of creator of the land mass of Japan um, mm-hmm. in their sort of um, myths and folklore. Um, and you... But everybody sees you as a white wolf. So what you do is someone will be saying, I, oh, you know, you go, oh, you, I remember you go into one of the big cities um, and somebody's going, I wish that it would rain so my crops would grow. I can't feed my child and the child's there next to say, oh, I'm hungry, mum, I'm hungry. And you draw using your celestial brush a sun in the, uh, a rain cloud and it rains and the mum's really happy. And what you do is you get karma from it. So you actually get your currency to upgrade yourself as karma and you get it by helping the people. So there's a really nice, like, even as a central conceit in a, in a game that's sensibly like a sort of watercolour Japanese folklore version of Legend of Zelda, it's got a really mm. nice sort of way of, um, the, you get the karma, but you don't get any of the praise because they're like, oh, white wolf, I hope you find the person who did this and thank them for me sort of thing. <laughs> so it's this yeah. notion of like, do, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I like it. It's this notion of them doing all the work, but they don't need the praise. They're animals, you know, or like mm-hmm. they're, they're not doing it for the praise. They don't. I mean, it, it, it's, it's what's wonderful about the MCU um, is that they, you can take a moment. So, for example, Falcon and the Winter Soldier was arguably, they say it was created because of the one scene where they're in the car together in one of the Avengers movies or in Civil War um, when mm-hmm. Captain America gets a kiss from Agent, I don't know, the daughter of Agent Carter. I can't remember. So was, um, Pe- Sharon? Peggy? One of them. Sharon. Um and they had a little moment in the car, and and from that moment they were like, oh, we need to spin this off into a into an entire series. So there's a moment in the beginning of Endgame where Captain America is is having um, he's talking quite candidly about what happened during the blip, and he's talking to a sort of uh, a group of people like in a, a counselling session. Yeah, like a counselling session um, in a sort of in a hall somewhere. Um, and I and you could almost argue that that's if you took that one moment that it was very lovely in Endgame, but you were like, do you know what? I want to extrapolate that wide, MCU wide. Yeah. Um, that would be your way in. You'd say it's that scene, yeah. but with you know. Well, that's wonderful because, like, again, mine's a Netflix series, not a single <laughs> film, because it's not. It's really picking up on these things. But that could be like season two, you're opening season two or season three, maybe, because you probably got quite a lot up to there. Mm. Is these animals dealing with the fifty percent like that? That would be huge, wouldn't it? Like the end of season two is literally watching the city disappear, mm. and like yeah. and the opening yeah. of season three is that is having to deal with that. Um, so I quite like this. I mean, we haven't fleshed it out, but I like the I really like the premise of sort of people dealing with the aftermath or the current situation of superheroes mm. through sort of animals being. No, they, people they think it's their pet or a stray has come mm. to help them, and suddenly their world is a little bit better and a little bit mm. brighter. What would happen with um, Squirrel Girl if half of the squirrels in in her city disappeared? Well, you know, I, no one's. I don't know whether that's ever been addressed. I haven't read. Uh, I've read enough comic books in Squirrel Girl. I wonder whether that's been addressed. <laughs> yeah. She she probably was just one of the ones that got taken out, so they didn't have to address it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they wouldn't. The unbeatable squirrel girl would never be beaten. <laughs> Not even by that. She she she'd survive somehow. So we, I, I guess my my mate, I, I think it hasn't been fleshed out necessarily, but it is definitely the foundation of like a really genuinely unique idea. And if Wonder Vision could get made, which is a really great premise as well, mm-hmm. I think almost anything can. Still only halfway through. No spoilers. <laughs> yeah, I like. Uh, yeah, voice actors. Uh, do, do you know what? It could be yeah. one of those. Yeah, and it'd be would, really who strong would be voice. Who would we, who would we have? Who would be so lockjaw? Hmm. Well, Squirrel Girl's a real, sort of a real human, mm-hmm. so maybe she's not, like, the lead character in it, but maybe we How encounter her. Girl, I assume, means she's young. I, but I would basically well, have... yeah, I mean, girl can mean anything these days, doesn't it? But yeah. um, I think she's sort of... She, she's an, she actually ends up being the nanny for uh, Jessica Jones and Luke Cage's daughter. Mm. 
Is that Danielle? Might be Danielle. I don't know what the name of their uh, their daughter is. Anyway, um, so she's and she's at college, uh, the, like American University, I think. When she's the unbeatable. Story. I really like that girl from Booksmart. I've, 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 that's my touchstone for anything. She was the one that was in. She was also in Justified, and she was tipped to be uh, initially to be Ellie from The Last of Us. Like it's. Um, she's a real. I, I, someone will know. It's, it's, you give her a quick Google, but like, yeah, she's. I think she's. She's waiting to be installed into a su- position of, of superhero. Into a, su- a position of superhero. Heroic, hero- heroism. Yeah, definitely. Um, Lockjaw, I don't know enough about the character to be able to say, hey, I feel like it's this is Lockjaw. Wise, wise old, wise old, um, but like. John also Goodman. Super cool. What, like an AI version of John Goodman's. <laughs> I mean, he's a, well, he's, he's a, he could, he could go with someone British because he's a bulldog, isn't he? So Lockjaw, Lockjaw yeah. is the sort of like, a, is it, what they, what breed are they traditionally? A giant bulldog. Ooh. Giant bulldog. Well, then it, yeah. would it be wrong to say Jason, Jason Statham? Statham? <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> Well, that's it then. It's got to be Jason Statham. We've done it. it? Unbelievable. Although be. he has been the juggernaut. Oh no, that was no, not. That was um, that was re- the same thing really in my head. <laughs> I'm okay with Jason <laughs> they, Statham, really? you know. I want him to do like I a like proper it. British, like a return to form, you know. Like I even sort of his when he was in Snatch, or even even in Revolver. To be fair, like that's where his British. And then since then, he's been some sort of weird transatlantic version of himself. But I want like old school British. I want old how school. he is with his parents. Jason Statham, like, you know, that. Oh, Danny Dyer. Danny yeah. Dyer, mate. Yeah, he's got the chops. He could do it. That would be good. He's got the, he could do it. And yeah. it just ends, every, just ends every engagement with, nice one, bruv. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sort of okay with that, well, I just, Yeah. I've just found out that Lockjaw, like, there's a, there's a, there's a mini series called Lockjaw and the Pet Avengers. Oh. So, well, then we've got a little one to, to draw from, haven't we? Yeah, including Ms. Lion, who's Aunt May's puppy from Spider Man. That's that is so. Awesome. That's yeah. So now, now we're bringing it all in together. Pro- There's also proof that Dan hasn't done his research. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> There's, but the thing is, absolutely. there's so much to to find. That's the beauty of this thing. It's like once you go mm, yeah. down a rabbit hole of of you know, once you pick an obscure character, you can find so many. I mean, I I, I loved like. Um, I don't think we have the uh, wherewithal to talk about Blade today, although I'd love to, and I'm excited about what they're doing next. Um, but yeah, there's there's the um, the night. I mean, all of the the villains in the Blade canon are amazing, but we only saw a handful of them in the movie, so I'm really excited. So, well, like once you go down a a rabbit hole of Marvel uh, uh, trivia and and connections, it's yeah, it it, ne- it can never end. So I, so there's a whole set of Avengers, pet Avengers, and now we need so we need some of the. I, I, you've got to be like they've got to be voices that you that you don't traditionally hear in animated characters as well. You know, like I don't want to just have the same sort of people over and over again. I want you yeah. know these actors have to be people that you would almost never associate with this sort of thing, um, and just. Yeah, so, I mean Ethan Hawke has to be one of them. There's, there's, you've got to have like, Ethan. What Hawke. brilliant! Probably a Chihuahua. Oh, yeah, I like that he say has got to be. I love that. That's brilliant. <laughs> Ethan Hawke, I'd love to see him in an. I'd love to hear him in an animated film. I'm sure he has done one, but like, you know, he's he's an actor that I'd love to hear. In an I mean, I know it's we can't do it now. Well, we could take it from some deep fake, but I mean, has Alan Rickman ever been an animal? Because if not. <laughs> I feel like I'm happy for someone to tell us in the comments, but yeah, I am. I am. I feel like he should have done. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm on board with this, Dan. So it's gonna be it's gonna be live action, I assume. It's or is it? it I, that's just the last thing I would like to. Ask. Yeah, it feels like it should be because it should because we're gonna see some of the MCU things from the opposite direction, aren't we? From a different camera mm-hmm. angle. So, and I'd like the idea that some someone goes back and CGI's in some of these animals into the old, into the old films, after the after the fact and upsets people. I like yeah. that idea yeah. too. He he didn't voice an animal. But he did voice Marvin in the Dragon's Guide to the Marvin Galaxy. The oh yes, yes, yeah, of course it is. Yeah, that yes. makes sense. All right, hold on to whatever garment you are wearing underneath another pair of garment you are wearing, right? 
this is going to get cray cray. Mm -hmm. So I have gone for an Easter, a very obscure Easter egg that has turned that what now reading up on it has turned into the most bonkers series of comics I have to read and subsequently would love to be made into a film. Okay. So in Endgame, when they're talking about Thanos and what to do, they put Ant-Man in the suit and uh, War Machine uh, basically says, can't we just travel back in time when he's a baby? And, you know, and he does some obscene hand gestures and they're just like... So he's intimating that, like, you can just... That kill they just Thanos kill, that they the kill baby something. Thanos, right? right? That they kill baby Thanos. Um, and... And then they're like, A, that's disgusting, and B, like, no, that's not how time travel works. However, there is a series of graphic novels mm -hmm. um, where this is attempted, and it's it gets crazy. So, Frank Castle, mm -hmm. during the battle, who we know as the Punisher, mm -hmm. uh, is in the Earth TRN 666, which is appropriate, mm -hmm. um, is killed by a building falling on him that the Hulk has been thrown into. Right, okay. And he gets sent to hell, to which he will give anything to punish Thanos for slaughtering an entire planet. And as you said earlier, Sean, the Mephisto uh, Easter egg, uh -huh. he makes a deal with Mephisto to become Ghost Rider. <laughs> so the Punisher becomes... Yeah. Ghost Rider, yep. which is already bonkers, mm -hmm. calling himself the Cosmic Ghost Rider. Yeah. So he his yes. his part his bike allows him to travel through the universes, and this is in awesome. this is in a t this is in a timeline where um, Thanos has killed everybody. Mm. King Thanos, he made a deal with death to kill basically everybody, and now he is the king of literally nothing because everyone's dead. <laughs> Um, and and it, it's insane. I'm just like everything I'm reading about this. Like he, like the Cosmic Rider teams up with an injured Galactus to try and take him on. Who Thanos just beheads because he's amazing. And then he has to fight the Fallen One. Always go for the head. <laughs> Always go for the head. Yeah, this is and Galactus, he has the to... uh, famous um, cloud of dust from the Silver Surfer movie that everyone loves. Well, so much. the Fallen One is well. the Silver Surfer who has spent oh. thousands of years being worthy enough to wield Mjolnir. Yeah. Awesome. And then so that's the silver he then has to with, a, with Mjolnir. This is this is a crossover. This is nuts. Yeah. This is this is bonkers. This is absolutely bonkers. Who then Silver Surfer's like cosmic right? level. Yeah. Who then like he then already. ends up he then ends up murdering the rider and Odin takes the Frank Castle Ghost Rider to Valhalla. He's not a good fit for Valhalla, apparently. Right? <laughs> yeah, so he brings him. Why. He brings him back to life. He would be though, wouldn't he? Frank Castle would belong in Valhalla. He's all about vengeance and bloodshed, and, and all, didn't you know, fit in with the rest of them. But that, yeah, they weren't about. But they're not about vengeance. They're about glory. Yeah, and, fair enough. You know. Death. So he brings him brings him back to life so he can fight Thanos again. Yeah. Who he then, trying to find out, finds out that um. Uh, what's the name of his daughter, Thanos' daughter? Gamora. Finds out Gamora is his daughter. So then kills all of the Guardians. <laughs> yeah. And and all of Dra like the, all the clones of Drax and everything. Kills all of them. Clones of Drax, and by the way, on its own is something I did not know about. Now yeah. I'm, yep. I'm sold. Yeah. Yep. Kills, kills, kills all of them, which is insane. Um, then gets, uh, gets the blessing of Helena uh, from Asgard. <laughs> And ends up um, falling, and he, he then he also takes over Avengers Mountain and kills all the Avengers. Mm -hmm. It's just it's insane. Like this is this is nuts. So this is like, uh, and obviously it just gets it gets crazier and crazier and crazier until he then sacrifices himself to save Camille. Yeah, um, there's some serious spoilers for the cosmic uh, the cosmic rider comic series. But it's 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 crazy. But like I just so the idea of. Frank Castle becoming Ghost Rider because I love Ghost Rider. I thought, you know, I, I really wanted it to be amazing. Um, you know, with especially Spirit of Vengeance with Idris Elba. We we'll forget he was in that <laughs> with a terrible French accent. Um, but it, you know, I it's, and I was just like trying to find cool Easter eggs for that, and the fact that there is one that crosses over. So I want to see a crossover where the Punisher becomes Ghost Rider, and it's like the smashing of those 
to crazy it's that cosmic worlds. world that's so awesome as well and this idea yeah. i don't know what i mean what's his bike like what, I his imagine bike has basically like, got like it, it look looks like? like a bike but the front wheel is like and looks like an energy orb like sort of looks like a, a hyperdrive basically the front wheel looks like a hyperdrive right. and he's yeah, still course, got the chain awesome, yeah. and he's got like the punisher the punisher logo like on his chest has got flaming because eyes because of the ghost rider skull because yeah, of the ghost rider yeah. thing so he's got yeah, the skull yeah, with yeah. flaming eyes and then the flaming head with the chain on on the cosmic bike so it's just crazy like I, you know I, I just to to see the sort of and again i think as you said what Thor, what Thor Ragnarok did really amazingly was it took you to this world that sort of we we got introduced to in Guardians of the Galaxy. This, but you know, beyond our shores was mm. it's the first time we really got to properly see it because all the other Marvel films so far at that point had been on Earth. Mm. Um, so it was you know it was the first one to sort of be out there, bright colours, all this sort of stuff. You know, even as you said, the big cloud of dust with with Silver Surfer and the the um, Fantastic Four. F- films you know that didn't really touch on other worlds and so that's this is this is crazy and it's just uh and looking at like all of his you know he's got like all of the skills of the ghost rider and then it's like oh and also all of the tactical and like wartime training of the punisher See, and now that's, you know, we've all... that's cool that's interesting because when you think of ghost rider you think he's an un sort of unhinged demonic figure that is hell-bent yeah. on sort of uh, um, this, this this sort of you know he has that sort of sin, like, ca- like chaos power and chaos and stuff. And, yeah, yeah yeah exactly um, and that you, power in a military tactician that would make is... what I, so if you so now I think like you'd sit there with the with the writers and you'd go there is going to be a sequence an action sequence the flagship action sequence that is part tactical military sort of espionage sort of shooter and part demon of chaos like make well, that happen. i think let's go the, let's figure the, out i that. guess like <laughs> go. The, the nuts yeah it would he be him just like you have the obligatory like level 100 versus level one a thousand level one scrubs isn't it where he's just like riding on the battlefield chain whipping them m60 mounted on the front of the car just like you know like in all, space in, in space like, this whatever. is not on land no no this it's on land space, and then and then, and then and then the ships come over and he ramps the bike up and he fights them nice you know so yeah. it's, you have all of that and then you know if you were going down the timeline it's like where then he then fights the fallen one so you like one of my favorite bits in in uh, end game was like when um captain america like picks up Mm. Um, picks up Michelle Nguyen and has like the sword and shield battle and it's like proper old school side scroller beater like like I think I even was in yeah the, it does look like the, a side scroller beater I even it? was like yeah, oh yeah. like what a combo you know what I mean <laughs> yeah. like you know it's like square square triangle like forward roll it upper and it's everything like that and it was like it, it felt like that and you know so having that sort of the, uh, a battle between a cosmic rider and then the it. fallen one that takes place mm. over an entire world where they just wreck the fuck out i'm of gonna it. do i'm gonna do one bit i'm gonna take that and i'm gonna say yep yeah, perfect and as i as you're seeing this side scrolling type beat em up type fight sequence on top you're seeing the tactical tactician of the punisher and then mirrored exactly underneath you're seeing the mirrored hell dimension of where he's fighting mm. and you see the ghost rider beneath and as he's fighting them up above when he kills them they go down underneath to hell where the Ghost Rider finishes them off. So you have like the two parts of, you know, you're literally seeing like a light, almost like, you know, when you're playing Sonic 2 on the Mega Drive with someone and you've got that split screen. So you're seeing the Punisher on top and then mirrored underneath, you're seeing the feet of the, of the Ghost Rider and they're oh, dying and going to hell and then being decimated by the Ghost Rider. It, I mean, even you know? if the, the military tactician of like, you, you know, like one of Sean's, you know, for the crowds, one of Sean's favourite uh, moments in like, in these sort of modern action films is in John Wick 2 when he sets himself, he sets his exfil up with like the shotgun yeah, and like cool. he sets his whole exfil up so he knows how to get out of there when it, when it all goes. He's got all guns on his way out of the exit. Yeah. He's yeah. So, video so imagine that. He's so imagine that. And then he bat, you know, bats imagine that military one. tactician but sort of set on an entire planet. So he's leading the fallen one around the planet where he set up like entire cities to blow up instead of just like or you know entire a giant sinkhole instead of just like a little snare trap or whatever like he set this entire planet up as his military 
playground to take this guy yeah, out. I mean, just that. like That's the, the yeah, I'm with it. Yeah, I mean, and I, it, just like the quote from it is: "Sadists, psychopaths, and killers doesn't matter what planet they're from, all deserve to be punished." <laughs> is that from? The, is that the tagline of the comic? That's the tagline of the rider. Yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah, it's yeah. like so. It's uh, you know you could see this, and it would be this whole. It would be this massive, like you know, it would be one of their properties that's like elsewhere. Because I, I, I don't exactly know what the stats were, but everybody really loved the Punisher series, like or or at least they very they loved the Punisher character that was in Daredevil mm. when it was on Netflix, um, and people went crazy over yeah. John. Blah blah blah, 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 whatever his name is. Yeah, that's definitely the that's, name. That's, yeah, my, yeah, favorite, that's, yeah, that's name. my favorite yeah, character from the MCU. But, you know, they went over like nuts for, for him casting. I, I don't really know who you cast because, you know, you've got you've got some big shoes to fill. You've got Thomas Jane. You know? <laughs> I remember that film. Thomas that Jane. was terrible. You've got Ray. Yeah, uh, you do, don't you? Get that guy. Uh, was he the guy from... Uh, he wasn't Punisher the, Warzone. He wasn't the guy from the... Ho- Hobbit was he? No. Yeah, he is the guy from The Hobbit. Uh, Ray Stevenson. Yeah. <laughs> got Ray Stevenson, who was a great Punisher. Like, I, you know, I... I it's a shame it was a terrible film, but he was a great Punisher because he's this, like, he's a massive, like, stoic guy. You know, David he played Hasselhoff that character well. really well. That's that. He is was... a retro Punisher. Yeah, he's a retro Punisher from one of the early... Who he also played Nick Fury, strangely enough, um, in an early Nick Fury um, pilot. But, um, yeah, I'm fairly certain there's a Hasselhoff Punisher... Um, not proud of, of knowing that. Um, a Dol- no, do you mean Dolph Lundgren? Oh, Punisher? shit, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Okay, yeah, Dolph Lundgren, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know why I was so thinking this, this, I got Vinnie jo- I got Vinnie Jones and Jason Staten to give me. But I just, I, you know, you, <laughs> yeah. this is like... It's okay. Oh, it's John okay. John, Berth- John Berthner was the name of the actor. There you go, not John Berthner. So John Berthner, you know, Ray Stevenson... Uh, okay. Dolph Lundgren, I've got a Thomas of... Jane. These, these are these are these are big shoes you got to fill for I've, playing I've the Punisher. Got, I've, got, I've got it. A friend of mine um, suggested this actor for a Ghost Rider idea that we were tossing around a long time ago when we were just talking about properties. This is way before MCU kicked off, mm. um, and this is one of Sam's ideas. And I'm going to out him and, so he can take responsibility for it. And we're going to have him on the podcast at some point. Um, he was saying that the Rider should be David Oyelowo. I hope I've pronounced his name right. So he's, it's the guy who played um, Martin Luther King in the movie Selma. So, like, it's somebody with absolute steely-eyed gravitas and determination. So now I don't know if that crosses over into Punisher territory, but I think that if you're going to... I think make it... You're gonna, this is going to be a cosmic, in my mind, it's a cosmic exploitation film. You know, you, like, you really want to go, like... It's yeah, you go right. You, you go, go to twelve out because you go it's to twelve, Punisher, mate, right? You know? And Ghost Rider. So there's no yeah. way that you can do it by halves. I mean, <laughs> I watched Black Dynamite the other day. I mean, that's definitely a comedy, obviously, but like absolute, absolute love for that sort of. Um, I, I also watched in the cinema across 110th Street a long time ago. Prince Charles um, did like a one pound. They do a one pound surprise film. Um, and it was across 110th Street, which is where the Bobby Womack tune comes from. And like, and it's that's a proper early black exploitation film. Um, and it's just, I don't know if you could bring that vibe in, um, or maybe the dude who played Black Dynamite. I, like, I'm, I, I can't remember his name, but like, I, I'm feeling like, with respect, because I, there are a lot of actors I like that are like uh, in middle-aged Michael Jai White, White. Yeah. But I'd like to see someone who can kick ass because he's he was also in quite a few of those um, sort of martial arts movies yeah um someone who can kick ass and has gravitas maybe john david washington i don't know but then also something that brings you know without being crass like just a different flavor like we've had a lot of sort of i don't think now is the time to see a a very angry middle-aged white man you know like that's do you know what i mean like (laughs) yeah um, that's true that's very true i feel like there's another anger that you can tap into perhaps um in the correct way and if if... well i mean the, the the other thing as well if you take him from this he didn't he he didn't die because he got killed. He died because a building landed on him that that the Hulk destroyed. So it's not even yeah. like he was given the fighting chance, you know. And I think that's you know probably adds it's to more of his more, anger. Yeah, it's almost more why he's annoyed. Yeah, definitely. But I think this is you know to sort of see a film like this that would have nothing to do with the MCU and just be like a like an absolute. I, I tell you who this would 100% attract 
into into geek into geekdom. Anyone who likes Fast and Furious films. <laughs> You're pitching it as Fast and the Furious meets Black Dynamite. This is this is this is like because it's going to be like. Fast and the Furious turned into their own superhero movies anyway. But you know what I'm yeah, saying? This yeah. this would be like really this is like it. big action, like galactic combat, big sexy bike, you know, that travels universes, bustly dudes fighting each other, you know, there's literally like it's it's I mean actually all I've done is just describe the next um Fast and Furious <laughs> yeah. film really, haven't you just I? Just haven't said in but space. In end. space, they are done. <laughs> I, I was doing a lot of research into Easter eggs themselves and little, little sort of hints and um, uh, sort of where the most rabid of fan bases were was something I was looking into. And there's a really interesting... So um, Guardians of the Galaxy 2, there's there apparently uh, James Gunn, the writer-director, he put in uh, an Easter egg of where Rocket's identity comes from, why Rocket, Rocket Raccoon, the voice by Bradley Cooper... He's a talking sort of cybernetic raccoon, a wise cracking raccoon with a with a with a massive gun and, and a penchant for sort of tech um, that rides around on the spaceship with the with the Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, and there is uh, there is a person on Reddit who has just gone absolutely bonkers with this incredible like there's like ciphers and there's. There's all sorts of things sort of trying to decipher the information that um, uh, that James Gunn allegedly put in there. And it's it's a real genuine. I mean, it's it's um, is, it, is the username Saurocron and it's just you can just Google, you know, Guys of Galaxy, Rocket Raccoon, Reddit and you'll find it if you know how to Google things. Um, and it's just incredibly complex. Um and I, I admire that because I think that's what's so wonderful about the internet is they're like a almost like a sort of um, a big computing engine, isn't it? Information's fed in and then mm. everybody has a different way of tackling it and you, you come out with sort of things that you never thought you could ever... Fi- you could never figure it out on your own. So all these, like, these alternate reality games that um, often come out, you know, where there's like a... a, a binary code at the bottom of a poster and someone's worked out that it takes you to a website yeah. and you get to the website and it's mm. got it, oh well they did it for the latest line of duty didn't they did they um that's going out they the, yeah they showed in the trailer on the magazine there was a qr code someone scanned the qr code and it took you to somewhere and then to gave you he worked out this code it took you to coordinates you went to the coordinates on google maps and it gave you something and then you worked out with and it was yeah. nuts absolutely nuts and i um sorry to no, to no, hijack no, no, i think we did the, uh, do we did this um we played this um, card. It was this puzzle card game by Mind Candy, um, and called Perplexity. Mm-hmm. Perplexity, and by by solving all these puzzles, you go onto an online portal and see if you got the right answers. Mm. And it was really really cool, but there was a meta puzzle over the top of this, and halfway through the series of these cards being released you found out that you were trying to be contacted by people from an alternate reality and they were only able to do it through these oh, cards. That's cool. And yeah. then suddenly the community of these puzzlers that had been working out these cards were trying to work out how to contact the people on the other side. And it was it and then in the end they sent they one person found the destination where there was a cube buried in in England, I think mm-hmm. it was in the end. And the person that found it won ten thousand pounds. That's awesome! Like so, it was this, and it was amazing. But everyone was working together, and like the level of complexity was insane. Like no one person could have yeah, done it on their own. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I know what you mean. Like this sort that of sort of crowd huge computer sort of brain. Yeah, yeah, sort of puzzle solving, and it, and it's and you think, oh, you know, Sherlock Holmes had all of that inside one brain, you know. But like, but it's but there's something really nice about being part of one tiny part of this whole sort of thing. Mm. Um, so, so there's a lot of love for Rocket Raccoon and his origin, and I thought um, that it's funny you talk about games, actually. So my pitch is a little bit unusual, and I think I'm going to take a bit of dramatic license with this, and I'm going to say that this is an official um, Guardians of the Galaxy uh, Rocket Raccoon origin, not an origin story, but it's like, but it's a video game, a Rocket Raccoon video game. And what you do is 
You play as Rocket Raccoon. It's a third-person sort of action shooter RPG um, as Rocket, but you have access to... Um, I, I guess it's... What's the name of the ship in the Guardians of the Galaxy? I can't remember. Um, Mantis? So you have, like, the Mantis 2. You know? I, don't, well, I, don't know if that, I don't know if that's and true. And it's birthed or not. from the, the, their ship. That he's made it himself, and it's like a smaller version, and that's his hub. And you fly around the galaxy... Oh no! Sorry, it's the Benatar. It's the Milano. Oh, is it? The, the, oh, the Milano. The Guardians yeah. of the Galaxy is the Milano. Yes. So it's it's the Milano too, and you go flying around the galaxy, <laughs> and it's Rocket's um, story. So like a lot of the main, you know how it works in video games. You've got lots of different quests and plots, but but the main thread is him untangling his own origin story, um, and I think it should be told like this. So. I was, listening to, I was listening to Art Blakely and the Jazz Messengers while I was thinking about this. And it's just totally awesome. Like, it's not... Everyone has their own thoughts about jazz. But, um, you know, there's, there's good jazz and bad jazz. There's all sorts of... There's good classical music and bad classical music. This is good jazz, right? This is jazz, jazz. And I was thinking that Rocket Raccoon, he'd love jazz. He'd go, oh, I've been around the entire galaxy. And what do you think? Like, at the end of the day, I love jazz. You know, who knew? So, he, so what I think that he's done is... You start the game, and he's telling you the story of his, you know, he's telling, he's sit, you're sitting in Rocket Raccoon's bar, and he's drinking a drink in his own bar, on an asteroid somewhere, in space, and he's telling you the story of how you all got here. Um, so the story has a lot of voiceover, and the story has a lot of sort of, you know, it's an unreliable narrator. Um, and I guess the gameplay is sort of close to, there's a game called Biomutant that's going to come out, but it's just a little ratchet and clanky, it's a little bit, you know, you have these weird and wonderful gadgets and weapons, um, but it's, but they do horrible things, you know, they're vile, you know, they, he has all these hilarious fun weaponry that he cobbles together on the fly and builds with all his bits, of pe bits and pieces that he picks up, scrap and all that, but they absolutely decimate his foes. And what you do is you yeah. set it in the world of Guardians of the Galaxy, but he's gone off on his own, his hiatus. He's gone, right, I'm, I'm, go I'm taking a leave. of Sabbatical. Yeah, he's taking a sabbatical. He hasn't taken leave in, you know, in so long. He's been doing the superhero thing. Um, he's turned over a new leaf. Um, but this will set him back on a path of you know, his old ways. Um, and maybe the animal will come out. Maybe there's even a power, you know, click L3 and R3, and you, and you shed off all of the armor so you're, like, you're super vulnerable. But, you could, but you're feral you know that's your feral power um so the character rocket is ripe for a video game i mean any game you can think of would like you know would fit this sort of thing um so he's telling you about this story and you're playing as rocket as he's telling you the story you know and you've got characters like i would say it's licensed but like let's say we've got bradley cooper in there playing rocket we've got um uh, I, I would expect that he would go to see the collector. So we'll get Benicio del Toro to come in. So all these people who like, we don't have to license them, but they're cool little in-jokes from some of the movies. So we draw in a bunch of the actors from a bunch of different planets that they go to. And uh, you maybe have Nova Prime. I think it's Nova Prime from the first Guardians of the Galaxy. That's like one of the early worlds he goes to. Um, maybe he's on, the, he's on the wireless. He's on the phone to, to Groot. You know, and that's his, like, every so often he, chi he chimes into Groot and he does, he tells him about what he's been getting up to. And, like, it's his solace, you know, his sort of bro, he talks to his bro, Groot. But, of course, when we have that really emotional and really critical dialogue, we, you know, as an audience, we're not allowed, we don't sort of know anything that they're talking about. Because he's just saying, I am Groot over and over again. I am Groot. Um, so we have Vin Diesel come back. And he loves, Vin Diesel loves video games. He's a big WoW player and all yeah. that, big d and -er, So he, he'd absolutely mm -hmm. come on board that. Um, but here's the plot. Uh, fun fact about the, the word Groot, by the way. Yeah. Uh, I found this from watching Only Connect, uh, a little insight into my life there. <laughs> it's the Dutch for big, for large, for oh. huge. So when he says, I am Groot, he is also saying, I am big. <laughs> and I think that's... Uh, and I've just, I, the, when we found out, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. It right? also He's, makes it like triple emotional when he says, like, we are Groot, doesn't he? And like, do you remember that <laughs> yes. bit? And like... Together, yeah. like we are big, you know. Together we are, we are. Oh man, that's quite. That's getting me quite emotional. But see, that's the thing because Guardians of the Galaxy and, and James Gunn and his that whole shtick is like, and this whole game is going to be silly and fun and gory and like, but it's going to hit hard. You know, it's going to hit you hard when you find out the origins of Rocket. You know, maybe there's, you know, like that bit in God of War Three when you're bashing that guy in first person. You know, like maybe there's a bit where you're playing rocket through his eyes as as a real raccoon 
you know, and then and you're just doing stuff or whatever he is. He might actually not be a raccoon. I think it's, I really don't know the origins. This is the wonderful thing about it. As I'm just, um, I, I imagine he's just sort of, you know, he gets captured, he gets experimented on, he gets changed, and you actually undergo that, you know, in the game as well. Um, because I don't think a movie, I genuinely don't think a movie would do that sort of thing justice. I think you've got to give it that sort of first person experience like you would get in a video game. You need to give it something that where you can actually go to some really interesting and dark places without having to worry about messing with the, the sort of the, the oeuvre of, of the MCU that you're putting out. Um, however, this isn't all going to be doom and gloom and, and, and sadness because this is what Rocket's doing. Because I was, I was, I was thinking about this the other day. Um, and I think that Rocket is chaotic good. If we're going to pick an alignment for him, he's good because we know that because he works with the Guardians. He's a good guy. He wants good stuff to happen to the people he likes, but he is chaotic the way he goes about it. Um, so what you're actually doing throughout the entire game is a little bit like Mafia 3, is that every time you come across a, a big sort of evil space crime lord from some sort of weird sort of race of, of, you know, and you go into his planet and, you know, you've got your ship, you go down to his planet, you do your missions and, and when you get to him, you can choose to recruit him. What you do to, when you recruit them is you actually recruit them to Rocket's Bar. So you recruit them and you grow this asteroid, you grow this massive, you know, you have this massive like, complex, bar complex on this asteroid, Rocket's Bar, people come from all around and all these little pockets of sort of, because he's a little bit of a wise guy, Rocket, so all of these sort of gangster planets you'll go in there and you will usurp in the you know the little crime lords um you're not big time but you go in there and you're taking them and you're sort of force press ganging them to sort of change their ways and work with you so in the end you've got a fully stocked up bar so like resource management of your bar is one of the aspects of the game you want to run rocket's cool bar where all of the people around the world hang <laughs> out it's like it's sort of jazz bar Love it. and then what you find out what what the last mission of the game all the crime lords are there now, all the mini mini bosses are there. So what they do is they bring all the crime lords from the galaxy to this one spot because they want to know what's going on. So they come here for a meeting and Rocket's like, yeah, yeah come in. You know, he's been building this thing for, for, for a year. Um, come in, come in and they all sit down. And what Rocket does is the entire last mission is you going around this bar that you've built up and gleefully setting the entire thing up to explode. And what he's done in his sabbatical <laughs> for that year is he's just found a way to just get all of the bad people in this quadrant of the galaxy in one place. That's the only mission he's been doing. And this wonderful, amazing bar you've been building, like you blow it up with glee because you're absolutely decimating like, you know, all the bad guys in the, in the galaxy. Brilliant. And then he just goes back to the rest of the Guardians of the Galaxy. You know, he's just, <laughs> that's it. He's done. Fuck Rocket's bar, but he's had a damn good, damn good time, you know? Um... And he doesn't tell anyone what he's been doing. Um, so rocket. It's so rocket. It's so rocket. And I was thinking, you know, it's 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 ripe for it's ripe for um, for a video game that sort of thing. This sort of ca this mm. chaos yeah. and yeah. this sort of uh, um, this sort of tone is something that you can really do in a game. And uh, yeah, and the menu, the menu screen at the start is. You know, Rocket's well, is bar, it is it going to be know. like fourth wall breaking, um, or I guess not. Maybe like it seems like it's fourth wall breaking, but the entire time he's been talking to Groot. Yeah. So so then obviously then like no one is. Yeah. So the whole voiceover so is him talking to Groot, basically. Yeah. 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 I think it would be. In and fact, that... it would be the bar, the the just the bit of the bar that he's at. He's brought back with him to the uh the ship you know the, the guardians of the galaxy ship oh so it's not even so it's like the you think so we see like let's say it's the menu screen or whatever we see him in the bar and then when the game starts we see the actual bar and then at the end it just turns out that there's literally like it's like two corner stools yeah and like half of the half of the <laughs> sign and he's just brought it in it's just yeah. like one square like a one by one square of it and he's yeah and, and then, then he just gets up and he's actually in the mood to actually in the and this is just his yeah this is just his memento of the year that he took off in <laughs> fact it might even be called something <laughs> like rocket's year off or rocket's holiday or something rocket's holiday is what it'd be called um, okay. Yeah, I guess you couldn't really call it Rocket Sabbatical. No. I mean, that would be funnier, but, <laughs> but like, like we would find that funny. Yeah. But... but then you reference the sabbatical in there, and then, then it's just and so it's just him and Groot basically. Groot's the, in fact, I, I love that it's a solo mission though. I know, like, 
group yeah I, 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 I love that it's a solo mission as well because you have you do have the emotional payoff when he finds if he finds out or if he gets one step closer to finding out you know um his origins and things like that and um and maybe he doesn't even you know sort of glosses over that bit with Groot like doesn't actually tell it to him mm. gives him like a different version of it and then we the player see it or better yet come and make and connecting this whole thing up 360 right you play through a series of games and it's only if you do certain things do you actually find out the easter egg ending of what the actual thing is mm. so like if you collect do these like certain collectibles or whatever like if you mm. go to the place where it's the origin story it's like yeah i went there and then i i kicked ass and there was like a 50 foot enemy and i punched him in the balls <laughs> and you know and blew him up and it was amazing yeah and you play through that sequence in the game but then if you do this all get all the secrets then it's actually like the really depressing yeah. reason why he that's is it i transformed. like that There's, there is an easter egg proper ending that like james gunn is hinted yeah, at yeah. that you have to do a certain amount of things in a certain order and then i almost like i love it when games do like smash cuts and hard cuts like firewatch has a few hard cuts in there like i love a bit of editing in a video game it's a really interesting mm. combination of like agency and sort of sit in cinema which which has you know lack of agency so like i really like the idea of maybe the final mission is cut between you using all your powers to blow shit up and then it's like smash cut to like the reality of what's happening. And then you smash cut back to the fun. And it's like, which, and then he's like, Groot, which version do you want to hear? Which is real. You know? And, yeah, yeah. and that's, you know, and then, and how you've treated Groot throughout in the little video log messages, whether you've told him the truth or whether you've held stuff back would be whether you, you know, really give him the information or not. You know, like, what is your bond with him? Is he just a mate that you want to just like, you know, knock back a couple of drinks with? Or is he the mate that you sort of pour your heart and soul out to? So you sort of have that relationship with him. And then he's downloadable content, you know, a little bit of, you know, 699, a little bit of a Rocket and Group DLC mission. Chris Pratt comes back to do some voiceover for Star-Lord. It's like, yeah, all that sort of stuff. I'd, I'd play the shit out of that game. Yeah, it'd be good, wouldn't it? Yeah, so would I. It'd be good. And it will do, and it will do Rocket justice. And, for, and I want Doctor Doom in there somehow. I don't give I don't give a shit how he has to be in there. I don't I don't he, even know why. Be, I don't even like him that be much. The, I feel like he should be in there, shouldn't he? Doctor Doom, and it should be the be guy, the guy that gives you from the first Fantastic Four movie doing the doing the you know Kyle McLean. He and all he's the names. like your what you're buying, what you're selling guy, isn't he? He's like your your trader. He's like a defeated o- yeah, he's like cape. a defeated Doctor Doom who still has his knowledge <laughs> and his tech. But he's been like relegated to, you know, he's been defeated. He's probably never be defeated. Yeah. He's probably the first guy you recruit to the bar, and he's like in the back room, oh, like doing, making all your tech for you. Doctor Doom's the bartender of your bar. Like that's perfect. He's the first villain you fight. He's the first villain that you apprehend and sort of bring to you. And it's, oh, he's got the flames. Like remember the Mace Griffin Bounty Hunter? It's got like those old school sort of PlayStation Two, spa- you know, spaceship games. He's probably, and then he'll probably. Uh... He's the only person that Rocket tells about the bar. Yeah, and He's Doom, the only one. Doom's got like Doom's a tragic figure, right? A lot of these villains are tragic figures, so like they like, they understand Rocket. In fact, that's part of the storyline going forward. And maybe before you blow Just up the place, he blows them all. Yeah, up. but maybe you can do you in your conversations with them. You know, like your sort of your sort of Normandy hub for Mass Effect. When you're having these conversations, do they have they really reformed, or are they still evil? You know, do they? Does Doctor Doom really want to do something more? And and does Rocket even does care? does Rocket even care? Yeah. That's the point. Yeah. Like he he has that chat with them, and in the end, he's like, "See you, fellas." <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. He's gone. He's done. <laughs> oh man! So that was th- that was three different ideas, very different ideas, based on the Easter eggs that, uh, or, or tidbits of information, little bits of 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 content that seeps out of the either the internet because they find this stuff for us or out <laughs> of uh, you know post credit sequences and dvds and other things it's three completely different ideas and and three characters that i i didn't know had these journeys in the comics as well which i think is like really it's i i read you know a reasonable amount of comics probably about as many as i do books like i don't uh, uh, you know less than I do play games and, and watch movies, but I'm a huge fan of, of comic books, graphic novels, and, um, and, the, and the real sort of unsung heroes and titans that created this sort of stuff um, way before it was cool and way before 
um, you have the sort of big machines that are making this sort of stuff into content. Um, this was this was back when it when it sort of could be a lot freer. And I sort of implore anybody that 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 sort of loves what we do or even uh, loves the MCU and those films to to sort of delve into the back catalogue of some of these things like Planet Hulk as well for example I mean that's quite a well-known comic so I'm not like I'm not someone who really knows the obscure sort of comics but I'm always happy to take a recommendation our friend Sam Pei who hopefully we're gonna we'll have on Slash Dupe um, and he's got a, a podcast called Song by Song um, he is a huge comics aficionado and I went round his house and got completely scored Animal Man by Grant Morrison uh, just blew my mind and there's like a whole sort of so I, I love, I implore anybody to go down that rabbit hole, right? There are so many interesting Spider-Man comics, um, so many interesting Captain America comics, just things you wouldn't possibly imagine could be as, you know, as we've gone over today, that could be as possibly as interesting and deep and weird, weird, man. Like comics was a place mm. for, for counterculture and um, weirdness to, yeah. to come out, oddness. and. I mean, on the other side of that, that river with the DC stuff as well, there's, there's like iconic, mm. iconic things like the, Ta if, if you're not, Tower if you of Babel before things, yeah, is... you've got even like the killing joke mm. and stuff mm. like that, like to go right back to there. And I bought you that Red mm. Sun yeah, that was um, great. comic book, which yeah. is and what happens if Superman's ship lands 12 hours later and lands yeah. in Russia. Uh, like it's great. And I recently read uh, Mr. Miracle, right. which is DC ones as well. And that is that's a trip mm. and in fact i'll lend mm. that to you because mm. it's um it's just cra it's so interesting mm. so interesting and every panel is just yeah in uh amazing. in in tower of babel as it just said is um all of batman's plans for killing all of the um justice league if they went rogue get leaked and then start going into action oh that's which is, an awesome which is, like, premise yeah me. which is that's right. why it's why it's an amazing series mm. and then they're all like batman you're the bad guy and he's like no I, I had i had to make these plans because you guys have the because you guys are doing stuff like you're doing right now <laughs> and it's like it's it's really like that's an amazing yeah. run of, of, of also of, I, I maybe oh go on i was gonna say maybe less less uh how about next next Easter? Next Easter we'll do a, we'll do next the DC. Next Easter we'll shift to DC. Yeah, definitely. And then the year after we'll do we'll do Dark Horse. Yeah, and Vertigo and all that <laughs> because like I just finished um, Tempest, which is the fourth League of Extraordinary Gentlemen uh, graphic novel, and it's just off the chain. Oh, completely off the chain. Like, and I don't read a lot of off the wall comics, but this was just what just wonderful, just absolutely bonkers. And like, then you start. I love. This is why I loved it so much, because then you start researching and Googling these characters and finding out where they come from and mm. finding that literature out. And like, I feel like, you know, Alan Moore is, is in a different realm to me. And I like to be sort of schooled by these, by these <laughs> masters that know something, you know, more than I do, I guess. But um, so if anyone wants to be schooled by us, Ryan, not that we have anything to offer them. Um, but where can they where can they find us if they want to contribute with uh, with with their own Easter eggs and any of the things that that impacted them when they were like hold on a minute what does that mean and then they went and and researched it and figured it out later. If you just Google slash dupe, we are the only ones on the internet using it, which is amazing. But that is at slash dupe on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter as well. We've got a Reddit community as well we would love you to post your easter eggs in there we've got patreon if you want to support us and you can find this podcast wherever you listen to good podcasts to to check it out make sure you share it maybe embed it somewhere in your website as an easter egg somewhere <laughs> so if someone yeah, someone nice. you know does a couple of slashes somewhere on the on the web page you know what would have been really cool in there mm. sean is if we'd got to the end of the season and the easter egg was that the first word of every of every episode was a message to our or, or, or to our audience what? don't that... give them away the season two, <laughs> season, we'll season do that. two. Wait, why don't we do season... that for season two but we'll have to it would have to be the last word in every thing because then i can yeah of course give, yeah. it will give rise to my to a reason for me to continue that ridiculous like epitaph on the end of the podcast that i put in on yeva's episode i love it um <laughs> about the tree about the trees falling in the woods and all that i don't know why i wrote yeah. that um I, I was yeah uh, but 
it'll give me a reason to write something interesting about pitching and 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 sort of communal ideas and workshopping and and all sorts and and the, and the film film industry and then the last word maybe in season two might all come together to give you uh, some kind of Easter egg. It might not though. And then there'll be people on Reddit like <laughs> trying to delve into this stuff for for decades and it's meaningless. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's not a bad idea. Who knows? Who knows? There might already be an Easter egg in one of our previous episodes. <laughs> Welcome, by the way, Netflix. That's that's twenty percent of the idea. Or we've just stumbled upon something that they've been doing for years and no one's figured out. <laughs> that's why they changed that to the like the a badum. It's like something. If you pause it at the right one at that, you're getting oh, to man. something. Hey, if 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 there's any time to spend weeks and months of your life delving into the badum of Netflix, it's during a pandemic. So everybody, fill your boots. Go out and do mad things now. Before, before everything turns back to normal again and you're not allowed to spend hours <laughs> hunting these things down. But um Recorded in the Capo Studios 2021. What's up, danger?